On the Tape is presented by CME Group, where risk meets opportunity, and iConnections, reimagining how the investment industry connects. Welcome to the On the Tape podcast, Guy Adami, Danny Moses, Dan Nathan. Dan Nathan, how are you? I'm great. I'm Danny Moses, how are you? Oh my God. I miss me. I like being with you guys for a couple of weeks in a row. I'll be back up soon. So where are you? You're I'm in good, the man. FLA right now. Is that correct? That's correct. I mean, there's a man that has multiple homes. I mean, good on you, yeah. as they say, yeah. right? Good Not on true. you. Don't the British Not say true. things like that? Big on the tape podcast. We got Danny with us, obviously. And in a few minutes, we're going to talk to Stuart Sop, the CEO and co-founder of Current. We're going to drill down on some of this inflation data that I think, Dan, is still hot, but other people think is cooling a bit. We'll see what Stu has to think. Well, about. it is interesting that this was the the Fed's preferred mm. inflation reading okay. today, guy. Yeah, I just you, yeah. You know, okay. Well, we just wanted to do that a little bit. And, and interestingly enough, I mean, like you know, the headlines coming out of the PCE was that it kind of confirms the notion that the Fed is going to have some runway to sure. cut rates later. But you know, yields aren't moving a whole heck of a lot. Stock market liked it though, so yields not moving much. Stocks raging. Yes. Funny you should say that. Yeah. Indulge me as you typically do as at the beginning do. of every one of our shows. Yeah. Now I believe in our fourth year. Is that correct? Yes. Which is remarkable if you think about it. I read a lot of things this week. I don't just look at stock market stuff. I look at sports. I look at entertainment. I look at music. Yeah. And I saw this week, Danny Moses, that Queen, one of my top five bands of all time, by the way, is about to sell their catalog of music for $1.2 billion with a B. $1.2 billion with a B. And I say, getting back to my earlier point, good on your queen, because they're a tremendous band, and they can do, whoever purchases this catalog can do a lot with it in the advertising world. So good for them. Now it got me thinking. I'm a huge queen fan, as you both probably know. Uh, Their second to last album had a great song on it. The name of the song was I want it all, and I want it now. And if you think what's going on, and my phone just fell, if you think about what's going on in the world, people want it all. They want AI. They want GLP-1s. They want the stock market, the S&P, the NASDAQ. They want the Bitcoin. They want it all. By the way, it's it point out that in 1991, Queen's final album was Innuendo. One of the great songs off that album was the show must go on. The show must go on. Regardless of what's happening around you, the show must go on. I bring that up because Freddie Mercury died shortly thereafter mm-hmm. in 19. So he's singing about the show must go on, knowing that he was facing his own mortality. I find that to be poignant. But getting back to it, Dan, Nathan, I want it all, and I want it effing now, and that's the stock market. Danny, you know what's interesting? Um, Guy just mentioned all those risk assets that seem to be raging, and I know there's a whole host of goofy stuff that you want to talk about, and it seems like you can find one in each uh, market. But it was also fascinating that last week on the Curb Your Enthusiasm, I know you're a fan of Larry David's show. So so Richard Lewis was, and again, these are longtime friends. Richard Lewis is, I think, going back to the first season almost 20 years ago, and they're in a golf cart. Whenever I see any old guys in a golf cart, think of Danny Moses, uh, but they were literally talking about uh, Richard Willis. Uh, Richard Lewis changed his will, adding Larry David to it. And again, RIP Richard Lewis, uh, fabulous performer, fabulous entertainer, um, really fun part of that show, but kind of interesting stuff, kind of talking about what you're saying with uh, the Freddie Mercury I there a little bit. I think it's interesting. I think sometimes people can see, like they embrace yeah, the fact that, you know what, the end might be near, and they're coming to grips with things, Danny. And listen, so the end might be well, near. I don't know about me. I hope not. No, but, no, but 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 the broadening out of, well, of all this go. and the animal spirits that we're seeing again in, in in crypto and 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 meme stocks and the like. So, Danny, you're sitting down there in the FLA. You're seeing a bunch of this goofy stuff. The stock market's at all time highs here. Um, it seems like you know how much it's going up at this point. It, it's kind of you know it's just inching higher a little mm. bit, but other things are not inching higher. They're gapping higher, Danny. It feels you get that feeling again where this is like the tail. Each of these kind of rip up cycles has this feel to it. And it feels like we're nearing the end of it, whether it's temporary, whether it's a 2%, 5% sell off, or whether we are at or near the top. Every indicator has lined up. But those can go on for a long period of time. But when you start to see you have some of these new shit coins, which are popping up again, you're starting to see some of these heavily shorted names like Beyond Meat 
move higher on, you know, crappy numbers and you start to see that stuff, you got to start to ask yourself the question, you know, are we close to some form of a top and are people looking for any excuse to buy anything? And what I find really interesting is, by the way, Freddie Mercury's childhood home, not, let me back up. Freddie Mercury's home just listed for sale, his Georgian estate for $38 million. I just wanted to mention that also happened to coincide, guy, just another queen factoid in there. But when you look around the world and you see Nikkei hitting, um, you know, basically 1989 highs mm -hmm. or through those highs again, the irony in Japan, guy, and I know we're going to get into this, is that they're finally going to, I wouldn't call it raise rates, but end their negative rate policy, which will probably happen in April. The markets are cheering. And I do want to say for the people that think we're bearish all the time, and we've quoted Peter Bookvar, a good friend, over the years on just investing in Japan. And look at the two big banks in Japan, SMFG, MUFG, which obviously owns a piece of Morgan Stanley. Look at those two stocks. And when they end negative interest rate policy, those are the names that you can feel good about owning. And I think the Japanese banks are going to catch up to the Japanese market. So I know I drifted there a little bit, but my point is that people are busy chasing so many things. If you want to put your money in the market, this is not a time to go chase blindly things that are just happening, working in momentum. Do your work still because there's still opportunities, always opportunities. Guys. Sometimes you're looking for signs. We had, we had a whole podcast about signs. Signs, we, signs. Yep. We talked about Tesla, the band, and and I saw a sign this week, Dan, Nathan, maybe you want to discuss this or maybe you want to just sort of breeze right past it. But you've been doing CNBC's Fast Money for the better part of 15, one, five years. Is that an accurate assessment? Yes, sir. You've probably been doing TV a little longer than that, but ish. About that, 15. Yet something happened earlier this week uh, that I've never seen happen before. Really? And Danny just sort of got me thinking about it when he used the term shitcoin. Yeah. Well, we were we were talking about um, just some of the, there was a, a biotech stock that was up 100% yes, on was. some phase two data, which again- Phase it, one. Oh, phase one data. And so again, well, you know, oftentimes with little biotech stocks that are kind of pre-revenue, um, you know, you'll see that sort of behavior, right? Like, but it just seems like more and more, Danny, to the point that you were just making, you know, with a Beyond Meat, which is not a company that anyone's felt particularly bullish about their fundamentals and certainly not their products in a very long time, you know, gapping up on a beat and raise, that sort of thing, high short interest. Another one today is C3 um, AI. You know, we're seeing this stock up, I think at one point, you know, 20 some percent off of a beat and raise that I just didn't think was like commensurate with that sort of move. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I go and look, there's 33% short interest um, of that float. And so we're talking about this and I said, we're at the stage of the rally. OK, where it seems like every day we could pick a new pocket, um, a new risk asset that's going batshit. No. Yeah, that's what I said. And then you said that. And that's and, what I did. And I felt really bad about saying I that. I, I, I really did because I didn't mean to swear and not like, like I say the word shit like 50 times in my right. normal life. And it is kind of weird that you and I have mics in front of well, us for half the day. But that one hour of the day when we're on fast money, we can't say shit. And I bring it up yeah. not to be a wise person. Yes, you are. That's not, no, I'm not. I bring it up because. Sometimes you see signs that you, you get to a point where you're just you've reached your, you reached your boiling point. Kind and of. I'm not suggesting you did or I did. Yeah. But, you know, you're starting to see signs that people are just like they're done with it. And that that to me is a good sign. And I'm seeing it now, Danny Moses. I mean, maybe I'm out of my mind, but obviously Dan mentioned a lot of these individual names. And listen, I want it all. If you think about what's going on in all these AI stocks, I mean, NVIDIA does not go down. If you think about what's going on in these GLP-1 stocks, Eli Lilly does not go down. I mean, clearly. But now you get into crypto. And now everybody's a crypto expert, Danny. And I'm not asking you to play stock market with Bitcoin. But when you see the move in Bitcoin over the last couple of weeks, when it's gone effectively from, I want to say, 50,000-ish to 68,000, I think, it got, yeah, close enough. Over a couple week period of time, everybody now an expert. It's it just reeks of the things that you started the show talking about, Danny Moses. Yeah, I wouldn't overthink it. I just think it's supply and demand. Um, the advent of the ETFs. I think we're north of now seven billion dollars flowing in. I realize that's small potatoes compared to the two point two two point two trillion dollar crypto world. I think that we're in, and Bitcoin certainly has gone through a trillion dollars. Here And so you're seeing retail money and probably some institutional money just come in and make small allocations. And it's having a huge impact because the people that hadn't sold Bitcoin yet aren't selling. So I don't want to overread to that, but it is, to Dan's point and the point I made earlier in shitcoins, it is opening itself back up to this. What ETF is next? Here comes Ethereum. Let's get ahead of it. Let's all of a sudden this regulatory environment has opened up or the unregulated stuff is opened back up again. So I am seeing some of that. I want to clarify something that Dan mentioned about Beyond Meat. They did not guide up. 
I just want to make very clear, that's where the irony here is that not only they beat on revenues, they missed on earnings, they got it down. And it was a 40% short interest. It traded basically the entire float one day. I think it's 61 million float. It traded almost 50 million shares yesterday. The debt trades at 20 cents in the dollar. That's a convert that converts where? $206. The stock is at 10 people. Hello. Anyway, billion two in debt and 200 million in cash and burning. So I'll blend with that, with that stock. But point is that when you see stuff like that happen, and I called Benny Porter, and I use the phrase that we used, we used to use, rub the lotion on his skin, it gets the hose again, which is from Silence of the Lambs, which is put the lotion in the basket, which is the short basket, which these factor momentum things start occurring. What's in the basket? You can go on Bloomberg and look, heavily shorter names, and then you these names run, and they're always the same names that kind of run. So, so I think it's as it becomes more predictable, that's when you're kind of near the end. Like, the behavioral finance aspect of this, we are there, people. Yeah. We are we are in every single extreme. I am not calling the top here in this market, but I am calling a return to quality. And I, I mentioned before a couple of weeks ago, I did the analogy of a craps table. Don't be a pig here. Do not be a pig. Take your money and stick it on some other numbers. Well, yeah, and I'll just say this. Um, so, you know, we spent so much time talking about the Magnificent Seven. You kind of said SEAL Team Six. It's now like the Fab Four or something like that. And I just want to, so this is Thursday into the close. The S&P is up, you know, 30 basis points. It's up 6.5% of the year. The NASDAQ 100 is up 60 basis points. It's up nearly 7% of the year. And so I just want to read a couple headlines that, you know, I woke up to um, this morning. And I think they're really important because these are three stocks that were in the fab seven or whatever the hell they were the magnificent seven heading into this <laughs> year okay um and they're all down on the year okay so here's the first one it's apple which is down uh today and it's down six and a half percent of the year apple is behind an ai and investors are getting impatient that's in the wall street journal here's another one um tesla is down obviously 20 percent on the year biden this is new york times biden calls chinese electric vehicles a security threat now i read this and i said to myself well this could actually be positive for Tesla, but it's down on a day like today, okay? And then the other one is the alphabet, okay, which is down on the year. And this really has to do with the fact that they keep trying to launch these generative AI products. And, and you know, again, these were meant to be a company that's an AI first company, and they had some issues with this um, image, uh, image generator product and a whole host of other things. But again, down on the year. So some of these really great stories of 2023 that help power a lot of the gains in the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100. They're also huge contributors from an earnings standpoint, right, to the S&P 500. They're kind of losing their way, or at least they're losing at least some of the things that have made these mega trends in the broad market. It we really saved the market in 2023. So think about this, Danny. And, and, and again, you brought this up um, before we were recording, and Guy and I have been talking about this on Fast Money. The AI trade and the GLP-1 trade as it relates to Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk, and now it's kind of working its way into like smaller cap biotechs, and that was one of the names earlier this week, Guy, that we were mm -hmm. talking about. They're kind of the same trade. They're crowded trades. Investors felt very comfortable because these are trends that are going to be around for years, if not decades, right? But now you have to be exposed to them if you're running money, and that's the kind of the passive thing, but also people thinking that they could outperform on an active basis. So I guess to me, keep your eyes open for these trades that are kind of coming undone. People were asking us, we shut up about Tesla. No, we wouldn't because we felt pretty confident that there were fundamental headwinds and that has played out. So Danny, talk to us a little bit about that. We can look at all the freaky stuff that's going on, all the stuff that's going batshit crazy, but there is stuff right before your eyes in some of the biggest companies in the world and they are starting to kind of work their way into other parts of these megatrends. You're right. I think we are down to the Beatles. You are down to the Fab Four. I think that's a really good point. And then any other excuse to find any of these other companies that have some piece of this. I want to point out two things that obviously happened this week. And everyone wants every company to have, quote, an AI strategy, because that does remind me, obviously, of the dot com when people would just add dot com to their name and so forth in the time period. But two things stuck out to me. Disney. So there's a small fund. I don't know how small it is called Blackwell's. And they basically took a $15 million position in Disney and went active. And basically, other than they want them to read their theme parks, said that Disney must produce an artificial intelligence strategy and share elements of that strategy with its shareholders. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, obviously, Disney's at the forefront of media technology. They've been incorporating forms of tech, all types of technology forever. I'm sure they're going to get there. My point is that 
They just want Disney to say it so the stock can go up and make a move. What's the other thing that happened? Weight Watchers, WW. I'll always call it Weight Watchers, WW. Oprah Winfrey today steps down from the board and she's going to donate her shares, which, by the way, down to three bucks a share to charity. Okay, what happened? They bought a company called Sequence Weight Watchers a year ago because they realized that they needed, or more than a year ago, they realized that they needed to get into kind of this GLP-1 type drug because they were worried that their business would be at risk, which was the correct assumption. So they bought a telehealth company that basically writes prescription. I know that tonight The Big Shot is debuting on CNBC, a documentary by our friend Melissa Lee talks about this exact thing. So these are things that are happening. So as positive as it is, Dan, for some companies, an excuse to buy, you just pointed out, it's also an excuse to sell. And if Google's strategy is messed up and Tesla's strategy and AI is messed up and Apple's doesn't have a formula strategy, you're giving people an excuse to look to other places. And so, again, I think what you'll have is overbought conditions and potentially ignored or oversold conditions on a name like a Google is going to get to a level potentially or an Apple, but you're going to hear that you can start to buy these stocks. So this is the theme. It's going to play out for all of 2024. We started almost a year ago. It'll be a year in May with the NVIDIA AI run-up. That's when that started. GLP started right around, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, or kind of around the same time, um, time period. And those trends are going to continue, mega trends as you call them. So it is interesting to watch. So I'd watch out for people getting overly enthused and overly bearish on both sides of the coin on those two products. We'll talk about Apple and Google in just one second. Danny Moses, listen to the question I'm about to ask Dan so you have time to prepare because I know you. You need time to prepare. Dan can do this <laughs> off the top of his head. You're a fan of lacrosse, right? I mean, yes. you grew up playing lacrosse yes. with a stick in your hand. Yep. Who would you deem to be the greatest lacrosse player of all, forget about Jim Brown. I get it. Jim Brown, yeah. Syracuse. Modern like, era. Modern era. So so there's it's it's basically the Michael Jordan versus the LeBron situation. Okay. Gary Gate. Gary Gate. Okay. And then there's obviously our main man, Paul Rabel. I'm friends with both of them. I love both those guys. And they both changed the game in two different periods. And they continue to change them, doing different things in the current period. Game changers. Yes. People, that when you think of the sport, you think of Gary Gate. Yes. You think of Paul Rabel. Yep. And Fair. I think of Paul Gate, by, by the way. Oh, so the Paul Gate is Gary, brothers. Yeah, the Gate brothers. We're just throw yep. them together. Yep. 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 Okay, Danny Moses, I'm going to play this game with you. You're a fan of the sports as well. Uh, give me a sport, and let's. Uh, I'll give you football. On the defensive side of the football, who would you put? Like, who is that person? First name that comes to mind? Lawrence Taylor, Lawrence the greatest. Taylor, number 56, New York Giants. I believe he was the second picked in that draft. Changed the game. Is that fair to say? Fair enough. Changed the game. Changed uh, Theismann's game. Think about it. Well, yeah. but he changed. I mean, teams had to scheme yep. for him. You had the left tackle position, which used to be just big dopey guys. All of a sudden, you needed a big athletic dude to stop an LT. Change the game. Blind side. Lawrence yep. Taylor. We agree. So yes. Gates, the, the Gates, Rabels, LT. I'm a hockey guy. Obviously, everybody says Gordy Howe. Love Gordy Howe. Wayne Gretzky, 100%. The best hockey player of all time is Connor McDavid. Don't at me. I'm just telling you flat out. Connor McDavid's next level. So in our world of investing, Okay, I just sort of set this up, Dan. In our world of investing, if you think of the one person, like he's at the, he or she, yep. top of the shit pile. Like you think of investing, you think of, <laughs> you think of investing, you think of? Steve Cohen. You think of Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett. I mean, I set all this up and you gave me Steve Cohen. <laughs> no, wanna, wrong. Wanna, you want to do it again? No, I don't want to do it again. And Danny, I mentioned this because Warren Buffett, he is the man, right? We agree with this, right? No, but see, all right, hold on. I, I don't agree with that. Like, I, okay, like, that's what I, makes like, a good podcast. Like, like, Push like, back. Like, like, it's just, it's kind of goofy in a way. And and you, I know that you don't actually really no, I don't. think that. I don't think so. That so, what are we doing here? Well, no, because, because like, like, think about this. And Carter made this point earlier in the week on Market Call that the relative performance of Berkshire Hathaway to the S and P five hundred from the lows, and he made this point, Danny, from the lows in 09 is horrible. Mm. Okay, and think about how many warrants that guy got for doing the sorts of deals that he did in G in his bathtub. Yeah, well, Bank like of all America. that sort of stuff. Bank America and Goldman Sachs, right. and the list goes on and on and on. So, like, I look at that guy. I think it's a hokey bunch of bullshit Whoa. that he's been putting on for all these years. I think it's a huge scam. Okay. to be honest, hokey with you. and all that notwithstanding. Yeah, Danny Moses. Some yeah. two things came out this week that sort of <laughs> caught my eye. Number one. Berkshire Hathaway, the aforementioned that's been trading like yeah. dog shit, dog shit, hundred and sixty seven billion dollars of cash just sitting around. Yeah. Now, my grandmother used to say to me, Danny, 
Little guy, she called me little guy. You have to save for a rainy day. Always save for a rainy day because the rainy day is going to come. So it's clear that the folks at Berkshire are saving for something. Put that on the shelf for a second. And then there's a little something called the Buffett indicator. Danny Moses, I know you're familiar with this. That is basically the market cap of all investable securities in the United States divided by GDP, gross domestic product, I believe that's Speaking your mind. I am speaking GDP, into the mic. GDP, gross domestic GDP. product, yeah. The level that gets him concerned typically is somewhere around 120% is when it's sort of like, uh-oh. We have now reached 185%, flashing red. Last time we saw it remotely this close was in 2021 when we got over 200% when the world was sort of coming, crashing down. So Danny Moses, I say to you, if we've agreed ex Dan Nathan that Warren Buffett sits on, he's on the, the, uh, what is that, Mount Rushmore? He's on Mount Rushmore. He's got $167 billion and his indicator is flashing red. Thoughts on that? Well, that was a long setup, but I did. It was a nice job by me. So he certainly is one of the most revered investors. Yes. Certainly yeah, one of the OGs, a, a long buy and hold kind of guy. I won't go into all the things that he's done because I think there are some controversial positions he had had and, and so forth. We won't go there. But Druckenmiller is kind of the guy that I look to the most just in terms of, I think, the way that he thinks about the market. But put that aside. Buffett is a long-term investor. When he buys something, it's not you know, for a trade. So he's got to have something that he sees tremendous long, long-term long opportunity in. And obviously, Guy, to your point, he's not seeing a lot of those opportunities right now. He'd rather earn 5% with his cash sitting there and wait for that moment. We know he's big in the insurance market. That's kind of where he's, you know, and obviously big in the energy market at the time. And I'm sure if he could put more in Oxy, he probably would, but he's probably reached, reached you know, limit there. So every indicator, I could argue that indicator guy, maybe GDP is going to grow 100%. I, I don't think this. I don't think it's going to happen. But you know, maybe GDP grows more than we think a little bit, and you know, maybe stocks retreat a little bit, and you get to 150, 160. But that's one of 20 different indicators that are are currently flashing. And I think if you want to give Warren Buffett credit for something, like I just mentioned, I think he tries to buy quality companies that he think have long term power, um, long term presence, M um, and A opportunities, et cetera. And that's just not what this market's all about right now. It's not his type of market. So. Those are my comments on that. I will tell you, I've met Wayne Gretzky. I asked him the question, who is the best hockey player you've ever seen? He said, Connor McDavid. So I wanted to confirm your thing. So I just wanted to confirm that. Anyway. You know know what's funny? I I was um, at the Post House. You remember that joint? It was was actually- Can I tell you something? You love that. In the Lowell Hotel, in the lobby of the Lowell Hotel. Madison and 60. Post House. Yeah. Aged Cajun ribeye. I love it. Unbelievable. So right before it closed, the last time I ate there- uh, Wayne Gretzky was at the bar. I did not go up and talk to him. I did not ask him who his favorite hockey player was, but um, that is my uh, Wayne Gretzky mm. story. And that place was a favorite of the Wall Street elite we back in the day. The I don't know why I, I was there. Um, I'll say this about Warren Buffett. You know, you say $178 billion in cash. You know, it's interesting that, you know, a, a, Apple is one of their huge positions, right? And it's been a home run for them. And if you think about that, right, over the last 10 years or so, what Warren Buffett in his $180 billion is doing is he's waiting for another market you know, dislocation, because that's where he actually gets all the alpha when you think about it. Right. And, and so, I, you know, again, it'll be really interesting to see very sadly, you know, uh, he won't be with us at some point in the not so distant future. Do you know something? Well, I mean, he's an old man. Oh. And, and so obviously, oh, they, no, they, they, you know, and, and, and his, his pal, um, Munger is is no longer with us and RIP to to to, to him. But um, you know, they're waiting for a big dislocation and exactly. we just that's, haven't that, had one. That's exactly the point. They're waiting for something to happen. They're clearly and I don't think any of us are saying that is a market timing indicator by any stretch of the imagination. But in all seriousness, when a group individual of that magnitude, and by the way, as Danny mentioned, there are other people that are sort of in the same camp, Jamie Dimon earlier this week. David D. Sol Solomon earlier this week making, I don't want to say similar comments, but comments along the same lines where they're seeing some of the concerns. But when you see a Berkshire Hathaway with a cash position, again, of that magnitude and the thing, the indicator that he has said himself is one of the biggest things that he looks at flashing red. I mean, you can say, I get it and say, you know what? It's different this time. That's fine. 
But if we didn't bring it to your attention, we wouldn't be doing our jobs. Yeah, and I guess the point is going back to the concentration and then the broadening out. It's just like you know Warren Buffett and in, in, in Berkshire Hathaway. They're not traders, right? They're taking a, a you know probably a five, ten, even longer term view. Every once in a while, they get things wrong. You remember about ten years ago, guy? Mm-hmm. I think they loaded into large integrated oils and stuff. In the same time, they were buying, I think Apple, and they cut those positions. I remember he cut a position in IBM, like like literally, you know, um, when you get those. 30- 13 Fs and you see, ah, you know, usually those stocks used to rally when it would be disclosed that Buffett took a position. Um, those stocks were lights out once he started selling them because if the, the the best value investor on the planet no longer thinks you're cheap and and well discounted stock to the market is not a value, you know, why the hell do you want to be holding that sort of thing? So, you know, to me, I just think that let's pay attention here, people. If Google can't get their act together, that stock's going much lower. Apple looks like it's probably got another 10% to the the downside before they get something going in AI. The Tesla story gets worse. Um, I follow this guy, Troy Tesla, Danny. I sent you his um, Q1 estimates. They keep going lower, much lower than where the streets are, uh, where the street is for deliveries. I actually think Microsoft is probably the next one to see a kind of 10% pullback. If you look at this thing from early January, this stock was trading, I don't know, uh, down there at what, 365, 366, just topped out at 410 or so. To me, if that story doesn't get incrementally better, where they're be able to, you know, kind of goose their out quarter or whatever, you're going to have a pullback in that one too. So I have one other Buffett story here that Please. for those who are around, and you guys might remember this. It was floated around. I think it was more than rumor. So in 2008, the SP was obviously on its ass. They made the low in March of 2009. Buffett was out there uh, supposedly, and I think accurately, at Goldman Sachs selling puts in the S&P. I think you guys mm-hmm. remember that. It was, it was around 1,200 the S&P. He sold the 1,100, 1,000, 900, 800. And there was a Duke and Duke moment there, which really spooked the market. You know, you look for reasons that markets are down, whatever. So the rumors were that, you know, Goldman had him by the balls, so to speak. Um, and it was margin call time. And top of everything else that was going on at the time. So the quid pro quo was I'll do a convert for you, you'll help me out. So if you remember that whole time period, again, there were more than rumors. I didn't see the trades, but I just wanted to mention that as well. So even the great ones that try to time the downside in the market have that. Well, the irony also, I think it was 08 where he was out very, um, you know, aggressively calling options, weapons of mass destruction, financial weapons of mass destruction. And everybody knew that he was a huge downside put seller uh, in SPX and just kind of taking in that premium and not expecting the sort of event that happened uh, in late 08 and 09. But I obviously, you know, he had warrants to the upside. So he obviously had this kind of interesting trade on where he had this downside sensitivity to vol exploding in his face. And then he got a lot of long-term leverage when everything did kind of explode to I heard point. that story, a similar story. So I will, I will back up Danny Moses. You know, the stories were definitely out there and a lot of things were uh, going around the market at the time. It just goes to show you even the best get it wrong sometimes to your point earlier. Yeah. But Danny, this has been interesting for me. By the way, you mentioned rumors. I will say, and Amanda can choose to leave this in or not, but one of the great albums of all time. I think Fleetwood Mac, who I do believe sold their um, list of songs and their basically, um, what do they call that thing? Catalog. Catalog earlier or or the last couple of years. Rumor's a great album. And Fleetwood Mac's a great band. All the different things that went on in that bit, fascinating stuff. Yeah. I mean, I would love to get like a Mick Fleetwood or Stevie Nicks on our podcast. It would be great. But I digress. Black Rock, not Black Stone, Black Rock, very large organization, Danny Moses. They put out a paper earlier this week, and I actually agree with this, talking about there's going to be a pivot back to active investing away from passive investing. And I think that speaks to a lot of the things that you thought would happen this year as we sort of highlighted late last year what some of the themes of 2024 were going to be. And lo and behold, they're clearly a fan of Danny Moses, and they're picking up what you laid down. Yeah. Yes, it's interesting that the largest passive manager in the world would put out a note saying that they think there's going to be a little bit of a movement more towards active. I think they've seen the saturation level. I mean, how many – I think we're out of symbols, actually, for ETFs at this point. I don't think there's anything left. So we have to go to a whole different – add letters, letters in the alphabet, so to speak. But I do think that when we see the cracks in passive, I think we're going to see it in fixed income – 
um, prior to seeing it in equities, in my opinion. We're already seeing that happen. Um, passive fixed income just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And I think that people are stock picking, but they're also bond picking. And I think with the crisis, and yes, it is a crisis in commercial real estate, whether it's centered or spread out or not, it is a cr- ongoing, it's going to be an ongoing issue. I think that's going to prove to be somewhat of a catalyst for that. So I agree with what they wrote. Um, obviously, if they're right about it, it may not be great for them in the long run, but no, it's a good. I've enjoyed yeah. this conversation. As have I. Uh, you didn't cast complete aspersions toward Fleetwood Mac, although that was your inclination to do so. When we come back, we're going to talk to Stuart Sop about a number of things, inflation, and maybe his views on the great Fleetwood Mac. So stick around. A warm welcome back to the Anate Podcast, Guy Adami, Dan Nathan. And now we're joined by the aforementioned Stuart Sop, the CEO and co-founder of Current. Stuart, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, Guy. Stuart, you might have heard me ask Danny Moses a question. I'm going to ask you this question. Fleetwood Mac, where do you put them in sort of your litany, your 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 list of, of artists? So um, I'm a young man at 47, mm-hmm. so it's a little ahead of my time. However, I have seen a TikTok with someone skateboarding to Fleetwood Mac, uh-huh. and I thought that was very cool. Okay, fair enough. That's a good answer. I don't necessarily – I mean, I don't know what that means. I'm young. Do you know who George Washington is? Uh, I've of heard of him. Do. So, yep. I mean, I would not suggest you weren't – Anyway, I digress. <laughs> Before we get into the granularity of what's going on, yeah. we're two months into the year. How are things going at Currents, Stu? Things are going well um, from a corporate perspective. Um, you know, We've launched our bill card product in July last year, which is doing extremely well, building credit for the everyday American. And we've uh, launched uh, more broadly our Paycheck Advance product up to $500 between uh, paychecks, and that has gone live at the beginning of this month, the beginning of uh, February. So from a corporate perspective, we're doing really well. Um, seeing lots of healthy growth uh, and good economics and good marketing economics. And then from a consumer standpoint, um, it's tax refund season. So um, we started to see the big chats hit for our consumers, our, our, our members, um, about two weeks ago. And we saw some of the bigger files hit this week. And so what does that mean? It means the you know the everyday American is paying down their auto loans, their credit cards, they're paying their friends back. Um, and they're trying to, you know, make ends meet, and, and so this is a good Goldilocks period that you're seeing for for the for the everyday American from from this point on, probably until the end of March, things will be okay. All right, let's talk about that inflation data that mm-hmm. started this morning, because again, I think the way you categorize the everyday American, it's like a six twenty five and lower FICO store. That's right. And so, you know, the guy and I, you know, listen, we are not economists by any means. What do you say? You're not humorless enough. I'm guy? not smart enough nor oh, humorless. That's what you say. Enough I was gonna, I was gonna let you economist. say that you're smart list there. Um, but it's interesting because as long as we've been market participants, mm-hmm. right, and we think about the U.S. economy and we think about what drives it, it is the U.S. consumer. And when there's problems, it usually starts in that kind of everyday mm-hmm. American and lower. Last year, at some point, I can't remember when it was, you came on Fast Money uh, with us and you talked about, because you have this direct deposit um, yep. for a paycheck, you said that you're seeing more of your members um, with two paychecks coming in, meaning they went out to get other jobs. So when you think about this Goldilocks period that we're in right now, okay, so we've had this dramatic rise in rates, but this Goldilocks with with, uh, folks getting money back from the government, how long does that usually last? And you know what I'm saying? Like, is there, um, and and then really bridge the gap between what you were seeing with the the, the consumer, you know, let's say six months ago and what you're seeing now, and where do you think it's going in the next few months? Yeah, it's a good question. So since um, I was on last year, we saw an increase of um, uh, uh, our members taking more than uh, two or more jobs, and we saw an incremental 10% into the new year. So that pressure has maintained. Um, so people are working harder than ever before. They're trying to make ends meet. They're trying to do the right thing. You've seen the, I mean, let's not get into the the accuracy of the employment data from seasonality in January, but it was a, you know, it's a big number and they continue to be fairly tight. Um, and so I think when you couple that, th- those two numbers are like completely related. Basically, people are trying to find second jobs. They're trying to make ends meet. They have not given up. And there's still some gig economy work out there and some flex to be able to do that. So things, when, when you're asking how long does this last, it's really tax refund season. It's most of Feb or half of Feb and most of March. And then things, I think, get a little tighter into Q2 for the consumer. And so you can see that coming through in disposable personal income, mm-hmm. right. which has not gone up that much. And we're seeing obviously all time highs in credit card debt um, and personal loans and things like that. So 
working two jobs, taking on more, more personal debt, more revolving, more dangerous stuff. We're in a sort of this sort of, uh, you know, a truce for six, six weeks or so. And I think it then starts to bite again for the U.S. consumer in Q2. Let's talk about this inflation data really quickly. This is from Axios. We'll put it in the show notes mm -hmm. here. The, that core inflation reading was the highest in a year uh, mm -hmm. on a month to month basis. And I think this was really interesting. Um, it said overall personal income rose 1% in January. At first glance, a huge gain driven by Social Security cost of living adjustment and higher dividends on stock portfolios. But tease it apart, Americans' income picture. Guy, you've been making this point mm -hmm. was gloomier okay disposable personal income income after taxes rose a mere 0.3 percent so Scott, you've corrected me on a couple pods because we were saying, okay, oh, no, so a person, no, 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 but you're right to do it because again, this is not our ballywick, if you will. You know, we're just kind of taking in this stuff. But if you know, again, personal income is not rising as much as inflation, you know, then sooner or later you're going to have a problem. Put that together with what Stu's talking about this period we're in right now. Some of the data can look better than it really is under the surface, and that's why I believe, and Stu can sort of opine on this as well. That's why I believe, although the stock market's effectively an all-time high. The unemployment rate is still below 4%. Mm -hmm. Inflation is still going up, but obviously less fast than it had been going up over the last year and a half. I mean, all signs mm -hmm. theoretically should point to people feeling good about the economy. But the reality suggests, and the polls suggest, that people really don't feel well at all. As a matter of fact, I think the uh, approval rating for the administration, or as you pointed out on an earlier show, hmm. lack of approval rating. Disapproval. Is, yeah. Disapproval is somewhere around 30% or so. So Stu, I throw mm -hmm. this back to you. I understand why people feel really poorly about things, but do you, you answered it, I think, with your mm -hmm. last response, but do you get that sense that that's why people are so disenchanted? Yeah, I think it's exactly that. I think there's a lot of promises that are made at the through COVID that were probably uh, not adhered to. Um, Wait, what do you mean? Let's let's talk about that for a second. Because I, like one of the headlines this week was that the administration's canceling more than a billion dollars of student debt. I mean, that was a promise made in COVID, and they're trying to follow through on it. Mm, and I give the president in an election lot, year. Well, I, but but they're canceling the debt. I mean, yeah. like so, like if you are one of those folks who has that mm -hmm. student debt and you're having it canceled, well, you're probably not unhappy. You know, about it's it, interesting. Right? No. That's an interesting term, and I don't want to play politics. It's not play canceled. politics. It's no, we're paying for it. It's Somebody's so, paying. We're for all paying. Well, for I know, it. but think about it. If you're like, <laughs> no, but any, but it's it's important to point out. It just yeah. doesn't go into the ether. I mean, no, no, no. somebody's paying for it. We're, but anyway, we're paying for continue. It. Yeah, I, I just think that um, uh, there was lots of promises made about the future of America, obviously, and and, and the beginning of every uh, uh, administration, and the lots of money was printed and distributed, mm -hmm. and the you know some was was given directly to. Uh, everyday American households. And that's just, it did something, it increased savings rates. Um, and we're still drilling those down a little bit. Mm -hmm. they, they were elevated for like a couple of years, but we're getting to the end of that, right? And so there's no free free energy in the world. Inflation went up because we just printed all this money and there's only so many fixed goods and supply chain issues that we're, we're all working through and ha now have been largely resolved, X, some energy stuff. And so I think we just got to this point where that buffer and that, and that, um, and and that and that bank that um, that the average household had is now almost gone, and you're working harder mm -hmm. for the same thing. So the average grocery bill, you, you can see it out there, like CPI and this core inflation, they are they are not really good measures mm -hmm. of an average person's uh, basket of goods with their fuel and all this other stuff. They really aren't. And just because the um, the rate of change has slowed. The absolute price is 30 to 50% higher, right. depending on where you live. And no one got a 30 to 50% uh, wage increase. Mm -hmm. uh, and because uh, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, staples like you know rent and food and, and fuel just make up the vast majority of your spend, right? And so, I, look, there's just, unfortunately, it's hitting the people who uh, probably work the hardest and have the least uh, left over. And I think that is translating into dissatisfaction. And we're just seeing some of these numbers start to crest and, and sort of roll over into Q2, I think. The numbers suggest, and again, this is sort of non-political, but I think 65% of people in the United States live paycheck to paycheck. About 70% of people said that if they were to have an emergency expense of about $500, they wouldn't be able to pay that. I think one in six That's people, right. Stu, in this country are what they call food insecure. Now, I don't know the accuracy of that, but the numbers are what they are. Yeah. And that speaks to, again, this disenchantment and the problems that people are facing, which, again, 
goes back to your business and how you're trying to help and elevate yeah. that client base. Insatiable demand for, for liquidity, uh, credit building so that you can access cheaper liquidity, mm -hmm. the cost of that capital, um, and also uh, banking services that can help you move forward in life. And so, you know, while you know, it's great to having uh, built and delivered these products, also it's a little sad that our uh, TAM increases substantially year after year in this uh, current environment. Yeah, and I guess listen, you know, our, I think our listeners have gotten to know you pretty well, and and Guy and I, uh, we've gotten to know you and the company and and Trevor and, yep. and your team pretty well. I mean, you guys are existing to serve a customer that is not well served by the existing financial services community, and and again, you are not a nonprofit; you are a, a no, bank. That's right. You're not a bank, but you are a financial. Uh, you know, fintech company that are, 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 you know, you're looking to kind of serve an underserved group of Americans. And so good on you on that. I just want to uh, add one last thing about that inflation data. So I think it's interesting because this kind of lines up with what you just said, Stu. They kind of end this Axios piece. Sluggage, real income growth could dampen future consumer spending and keep Americans' yeah. uh, economic opti optimism low. And that is really the backdrop, I guess, of what's going on when you think about yeah. the economy that we're in and how people are feeling about it. And when they head to the polls, whether it be in the primaries right now or in the fall. So um, again, it, it's just odd to me when you think about um, what's gone on over the last few years with risk assets, despite the mm -hmm. fact that we've had interest rates go where they are. So let's talk about the Fed sure. and what this means for them a little bit. Some of your views on yields here. Mm -hmm. We have a 10-year U.S. Treasury yield that's stuck at what, four and a quarter, mm -hmm. 430 yeah. or so, up from 3.8% um, just a couple months ago, down from 5% yeah. for or five months months ago, uh, you know, we have the Fed funds rate at the upper end of the band at five and a half percent, which a lot of folks coming into this year thought was going to be lower mm -hmm. by now, right? Yeah. So the rate cuts have been pushed out. Thoughts on yields in the backdrop of this employment data, inflation data, and, and really what we're seeing in the economy overall. Where do you think yields are going? Because again, we're talking about three cuts now, right, mm -hmm. Guy? And that was what? Right from six to three. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, my conspiracy hat on again towards the end of last year. I think the Fed, you remember they came out into December for the Santa rally and really yep. talked down yields back to the levels that you just mentioned. Yep. Uh, well, and the S&P exploded. Right, which point. it, it was, should. It was 45.50 and now yeah. it's just under 5,100. Right? right. And so the Santa rally is a real thing to manage liquidity over the end of year, right? So there's lots of market technical reasons why the Fed would want to do that. Mm -hmm. And then they walked it all back uh, as, they, uh, as, as much as they could into the new year. Um, I think that um, you know earnings have kind of held up. People are losing their jobs, but on the margin to improve um, some of their um, some of their reports, some of their earnings calls. Right, so it's like a modest sort of sh uh, sort of uh, letting go or, or shedding of, of people. It's not like. 25%, you know, 20%, it's all this sort of 2 to 13%, yeah. which is like improve like things are getting tighter and harder uh for many corporates in America and so what they're doing is just sort of managing that glide path to a so what they would uh, assume as a soft landing. When it comes to the tens at four and a quarter, I think there is way more room at this point in time on the top side. I think yields go if I was a betting man uh, four and three quarters, mm -hmm. we could even double top, but which I wouldn't bet money on that. But you know, who knows? Bitcoin's at sixty three thousand, so who knows what happens? Um, so I think the market will do the talking and most of the tightening for the Fed. The Fed doesn't have to do too. They have to talk like more hawkishly for sure than they were. You look at the RBNZ, right? Smaller economy. A month ago, we're going, hey, we're going to have to hike here. Right, that was the first canary in the coal mine, right? And and so I was looking at that, going, "Wow, okay, we're we're really going back. Like this is like the seventies. We've seen the first peak, but actually, maybe we're in the second trough here. So maybe we're going to reaccelerate. We haven't done enough. We're not we're not tight enough because of the QE QT games that the Fed and the Treasury have been playing over the last couple of years. So I think we're now in this point where um, uh, a lot of market operations are rolling off." BT, B, BTFD mm -hmm. at the end of March, we look at the reverse repos, like drilling down savings rate for the consumers, nearly nearly break even. So I think you're you're sort of they're looking at this, going, all right, inflation's picking up. All the stimulus kind of behind the scenes money is going to roll off naturally. Now we're not going to extend anything, so things are going to get tighter. And then the market is now going to start if we start talking like, hey, maybe we don't cut so much this year. The market's going to price it higher. So I think they're going to talk the market into doing the job for them because they sure as hell don't want to hike. There's no way they want to hike, right? And so I think they're going to do that. And then what I think will happen is into end of Q1, into Q2, you start seeing this tightening really affect earnings and predictions on the equity market. And guess what? Mag7 
probably gets nailed on that. Probably. Well, it's already the Fab Four guy. Are you a fan of the Fab Four? Yeah, the Beatles. Why not? If you were to rate Stuart, this is for you. Okay, I want you to think yeah. about this. Okay, we know who the Beatles are, but for those that don't know, <laughs> I'll sort of put it out there. Obviously, the great Paul McCartney, yep, on the bass. John Lennon, one of the great guitarists of all time, George Harrison, yep. and obviously Ringo Starr. If you were to rate those band members in terms of talent, in terms of talent, how would you rate the Beatles? Wow. Well, Ringo Starr was the voice of Thomas the Tank Engine for a while, so I so felt I, I'm not really, sure what. Yeah, that has you to didn't do know this. Anything. Oh, there you no, go. So he was also know. a TV star. Mm -hmm. So yeah. multi, multi talented. So there. you're putting Ringo high up there. That's no, never been done. Never been done. Well, I'm, never, I'm just saying because I know yeah. that he did. Multi, he's done multi mixed uh -huh. media. Um, yeah. Well, clearly Paul McCartney number one. I agree with that. Um, the, the, the George and Le uh, 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 but maybe George Harrison. Next. I agree with that. Here we Lennon go. three, Lennon three, and all right. Hold on, that's probably Paul where McCartney. Go. It's just recency bias. To no, be honest. no. If John no, Lennon no, was no. still around, no, no, John Lennon. Oh no, no, no! Don't please. Uh, now we're going to get off topic because a lot even, of folks would put George Harrison number one. Let me tell you, a you. lot of people yes. would put John Lennon number four. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, so Stu, there are three hundred forty-five million people in the United States. The that's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. And then I, you know, I didn't go to law school, although I know all good lawyers should know the answer to the question before they ask it. I don't know the answer to this yeah. question. Understanding that probably rates staying where they are is the right answer, but you can't choose that. What should we be rooting for? Yields to go higher or yields to go lower? I know the, the obvious answer is lower. I'm not so sure, though, that's the case. Thoughts on that? I think, oh, man, you, you, you phrased it in such a very particular way. <laughs> um, both of them are, actually have the same outcome. So if we're rooting for lower, it means something blew up, and I don't think anything blows up until they go higher. So I actually, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be perverse and say both of them are the same answer. It's interesting because Carter Worth, feel, you know, th th we're in this environment, Dan, where I think that either outcome, to Stu's point, I didn't, mm. we didn't rehearse this. Right. Mm. Either outcome could actually be deleterious. You like that? Yeah. For, for, that means for, bad. For that means bad. Yeah, I'm what are your thoughts all. there, Dan Nathan? I mean, listen, you know, I, I've gotten um, a little more like the soft landing consensus is about as broad as like the, uh, you know, the confidence in a, a recession in 2023 coming into it right now. So, like, you know, I tend to be a bit of a contrarian, um, but I'm looking around here and I'm saying, yeah, there's some stuff under the surface. I mean, guy, you've been ma making this point. It really is about unemployment when that starts to take over four percent. You just mentioned this, Stu, that, you know, um, it depends how you are calculating that yep. number but even if that number let's just say it's calculated properly and that number is 4.3 percent accounting for the people that you know long-term unemployed or this or whatever well then actually you can make a case that the economy is doing okay with interest rates where they are with fed funds where they are let's just say throw a dart and just say we're at 4.3 percent so we're not at 50-year lows mm -hmm. we're at 30-year low whatever you know what i'm saying and inflation let's say is manageable relative to where you know, like, I don't know. I, no, I, mean, no, I, don't know. I don't know either. I'll say this, Stu. I think what's happening mm -hmm. in the economy are people spending money. Mm -hmm. People are combating inflation with credit. And yes. that's manifesting itself in the numbers that's that right. you just portrayed before. That's right. $1.15 trillion of credit card debt. U.S. consumer credit in aggregate is north of $17.5 trillion. The average rate on a credit card loan now is 21.47%. So yeah. if, the, if that's a great economy, then what do you usually say, Dan? Have at it. Have at it, people. Thoughts on that, Stu? <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Um, that's exactly how we're looking at things. In terms of like fragility, where I'd be looking uh, for anything to fray, at least in our space, is in trucking or or logistics. If you if you see any kind of like mass job losses on that, that would be the heartbeat mm -hmm. of America starting to say, okay, this is kind of like over for a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're we're looking at that. Um, Everything so so uh, wage inflation or wage pr um, disposable income is either not going down or is mildly higher, and people are taking on far more debt. That's just basic math now because yep. the savings rates have, have sort of been drilled to close to zero. And so now you're. I know I was on Fast Money the other day, mm -hmm. sort of saying you did same. a great job. By Th the way, thank you. I, I was trying I was trying to get over that. And this was before the Discover Cap One news. Yeah, and I'm not privy to that number. No, no, I was not privy to that. So, so my point was then that you should watch the credit card space because I can see things in our data and what I'm seeing in the market whereby subprime charge-offs and even near-prime charge-offs are extreme, like the double of what they would normally have. And also the cost of capital. A lot of credit card firms, very cyclical business, but a lot of credit card firms have funded near zero for like a decade. Now they're funding at like 5% plus so for whatever 
whatever that is. So like, unless they have a bank, right? And so you're going to see stress in that system. They're going to pull up their credit boxes. They're not going to extend as much anymore, right? So they're saying, okay, I can't afford to go down into the deep subprime or even subprime or anywhere near it. And actually I'm only in mm -hmm. super prime. And you've seen that from Bank of America, Wells Fargo. They're proud. They're saying, hey, we've hardly lent to anyone, guys. Yeah. We should reward us. And so there's a whole tranche of America just more and more every that's month exactly cannot right. get access to this vital credit or lending that they need. And so that's what I'm calling out. There's a problem uh, sort of emerging here. How does this... Um Capital One bid for Discover mm -hmm. fix that. If this is a, a customer base that they serve to some degree, and let's talk about some of the reverberations around fintech and and, and what it means for a company like yours that is basically serving uh, a very similar customer in a different fashion, though. That's right. Yes, yeah, Cap One. Um, you know, I don't know any more than anyone else has yeah. read, right? So. Um, but Cap One, famous barbell strategy, whether it's subprime and they're a super prime, right? So they have this sort of, you know, barbell strategy that works for them. I think it's an interesting somewhat, um, uh, uh, in, it's, it's just an interesting deal because, and, and sort of opportunistic is the word I was thinking of, because Discover is being banned around a little bit and they were starting to see losses. You remember that report? I think they earned yep. Q4 earnings, yep. I think it was in Jan. And it was, it was extreme and it was like, okay, they're not doing too well. Um, there's, there's three sort of interesting things that Cap One get here. One is obviously scale. You, you know, you merge Discover and Cap One. That is going to be, I think it was something like two hundred and fifty billion dollar loan book. This is like an extreme size. It's number probably number two issuer behind number JP two, Morgan. That's right. Yeah, number yeah. number two, and probably could easily scale past that at that point, right? And so that's an, that's an exciting thing for both of those companies. Um, and also, if I was to be you know, again, a little conspiracy theorist. If you if you were to merge the companies and you were both seeing extreme charge offs on the barbell on the lower end, all of a sudden you would have synergies. You could probably fire a lot of people and like sort of cover a lot of the problems that you're experiencing, right? So that could be good for both companies. Two, regulatory arbitrage. They've got this Durban uh, carve out for Discover, right? And so all of a sudden they're not. Um, uh, it, their debit interchange and all this stuff that we uh, we're allowed to take advantage of because we partner with smaller banks. All of a sudden, Cap One now has access to that at scale, right? So that's a big thing. Reverberation for fintech, maybe that's a big one. Um, and then three is um, the combined entities like an issuer. Uh, a network, right? So it's just like both of those things at scale. They got their own network. That's pretty exciting, I'm sure, for Cap One to to own. It looks more like. Amex in that sort of way. So, so guy, we had a great conversation with Treasurer Mar uh, Marshall. You know Trevor I, very I well. Saw him, I saw him early C today. CTO in the, in the and co-founder right. of, of Current on, on OK Computer. I think it was last week or two weeks ago, and we were talking about this deal. And you know, it's interesting because you just yeah. mentioned and and go listen to that. Actually, he 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 did a, a fabulous job on that. Um, but he was talking about this closed network and, and yep. really trying to make it look a bit more like American Express. That's and right. It's interesting to me right now. American Express is just like at all time highs, right? Yeah. And you just mentioned Discover. Like that quarter that they reported in January as their yeah. Q4 was not good. Like yeah, their expenses were really high. They're talking about risk management. They're talking about regulatory. They're talking about a whole host of other things. And generally in the stock market, Stu, we don't see deals for companies when they're doing really poorly, right? We see deals for company when, you know, everything is yeah, like, good. You, you, yeah, you, know, yeah. you know what I mean? Or, or that sort of thing. So talk to us a little bit about the timing of that, because the other thing is, and I know you're close to the private fintech community, mm -hmm. both investors and founders. It seems like from where I sit, because I'm also close to them, there's stuff going on there in, is, in the space yeah. right now. So it seems like folks, despite yields and despite maybe the, the worries about the economy and, and, and the like, people are kind of optimistic about deal making right now. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. M&A talk, I would say, I don't know anything, but I'm sure there's a bunch of confidential IPOs being filed for tech and fintech over the next sort of 12 months, something like that. So that's a good thing. Obviously, all-time highs in equities, so that helps in that tailwind. Um, the Cap One Discover thing, um, there's some nuance to it. Like, you know, now they can do debit uh, uh, out, outside the Durban Amendment, so that's interesting. Um, and so how does that affect fintechs out there? Um, I think for the same reason that they're working together, a lot of fintechs are talking, which is scale matters in a, you, if, if, you, if, you're, if you ascribe to this idea that we're not going to zerp, right, it's gone, and we're just going to have, you know, 3% minimum, and maybe it goes to 8% over 5, 10 years. So cost of capital is just much higher. Rebundling, um, looking at sort of like real profitable businesses, that's where the focus has been in the private sector. So costs have been uh, a focus. 
um, and, and so so has scale, and also just getting great unit economics, which you can do. You can do all those things in in fintechs because you have a tech firm and like you're on the front foot with products and things like that. And so I would say um, largely it hasn't had the same M and A fallout that everyone was predicting because fintechs and tech companies have moved very quickly to get their sort of houses in order. However. Going forward, going against some of these big companies, public companies that are emerging, you've got to get to scale, right? How does that happen? And so I think that's at the top of everyone's mind going forward. You mentioned the Durbin Amendment. I think that mm. is Dick Durbin that's from right. Illinois, yeah. spelled so. I-N. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to go back in time. You said you're still a relatively young man. But <laughs> when I was a commodities trader, Dan, I actually went to South Africa and I vis visited the Durbin Deep Mine. Mm. That's A-N. That's a gold mine, way down in the ground. All right, so you're getting a nerd gold. That's what you're going to do right yeah. now. I see where you're going right here. Exactly. The Bitcoin. So, so forget I'm about there. the Bitcoin for a second. Gold's hanging around here. And I know you have thoughts, because I know that deep down, you're still like a commodity FX guy. Yeah. So you see gold, dollar goes up, gold hangs in. Yields go up, gold hangs in. It's hanging around. It's like in the movie, remember Rounders? I mentioned this the other day. When Matt Damon's playing with John Malkovich, uh, you hang all night long, hang on, check, 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 hanging around until you until he snaps. Is gold about to snap higher? It. I don't think it's super soon. Um, we've got real, uh, real interest rates, so the fact that it's not going down under this is really important. Yeah. Like I think we should be. If you're a gold bug, you should be celebrating the fact that it actually marginally went up. Right, last time I was on the show, I think it was at two thousand, probably four months, three months ago. It's at twenty fifty ish mm -hmm. right now. It didn't go down, and real rates. And like, by the way, if if I'm right on that rates view, you know, we're going to see more positive real rates in the in the short term. I think at least. So so um, so I th I think we should be looking at like that. I think from a structural perspective, I've been pretty consistent. The gold is now money. The BRICS nations are 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 basically uh, moving gold from the west to the east or the south, or where, whichever way you want to call it. Um, and so that's providing that underlying bid on any dip, right? And so we are not ready yet for gold. Uh, to 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 rally because we need the dollar to come off and the dollar is not going to be ready to come. This is a, the gold and Bitcoin, other than what's happened very recently mm -hmm. with Bitcoin, um, are generally anti-dollar trades and the dollar is not ready to sell off in my So, so let's talk about that. The, so guy, you kind of buried the lead I because what he really either. wanted to do was talk about the nerd goal. He wanted to talk about Bitcoin <laughs> and you know this thing in the last yeah. month or so, it was under 40,000. I think it was 37,000. In you know January twentieth or something like that. Here we are right now as we're discussing this sixty two thousand. It traded um, as high as sixty three six four five zero today. Okay, so this Amazing. thing is up on a huge spike in in a very short period of time. Stu, what's going on here? Because if we have a dollar that is stayed put, we yeah. see, we see yields where they are, that sort of thing. Um, is it related to spot Bitcoin B ETFs? It, I I also think it could be one of those scenarios like you guys laid out, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Mm -hmm. This is just, what What did you say, Guy? For years during the crypto winter, you said this is also like gold. It's a hedge against central banks' ineptitude, and they're bound to make a mistake if they haven't already yet. I, I think it still is. I think the Guy's right on that. Um, I, have, I have not been as bullish as the market has showed me it is, uh, mainly because I see it as an anti-dollar trade. Now, the, the one time, not maybe it is one time, but... Um, onboarding of all these ETFs, right? Of just it's just been massive, and you can look at the numbers because it's all public information, and it's very obvious and easy to see. You combine that with the halvening, which is the Bitcoin mm -hmm. reward going in half in a month. That's so 2017. I, well, it happens every four years. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it happens every. It's it's it's, it's, it's code. Yeah. So we know yeah. when it happens ish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so 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 you look. Know, that's part of it um, so for sure. Miners and miner strategy, and, and and whether they hold on or dump, and all the stuff. So yeah. there's all these games that have been played for at least nine months before before the halvening. And then you've got this, this basically we've got fiat money being converted into a fixed scarce asset that you cannot print. And and um, we're just seeing the, the it's absolutely nuts right now. Right. So that's what's happening. Well, it's it is interesting. And you know, I mentioned Durban Deep Mine. The mining stocks <laughs> Did you and, see Bitcoin in there? Did I mention in the, <laughs> when I was there? No, I didn't. You know, I actually went there. <laughs> I'll show you my passport. I believe you. I was unbelievable. I had never been to the continent of Africa. Some think went, that Satoshi is, is South African. 
Oh, is that what people know? That's you just or Australian? No, I'm being serious. Like, isn't it just how funny? Isn't, like isn't it how? Isn't it how Finny? I think how Finny is just Satoshi. I don't know. I but so. what's interesting in terms of the finite number of dollars that are investable, hmm. what I find fascinating, Stu, and I'm not asking you to play stock market here. I'm just curious as to your thoughts from thirty thousand feet. The stock market, I think we can agree, is effectively at an all time high. True or false? True. True. Gold is effectively at an all time high within fifty dollars. True. True or false? True. Mining stocks, Newmont Mining, for example, is one third the price of its all time high. Explain that to me. If you can, if you can't I, say, guy, I have no effing idea. I have an opinion. Please. So, <laughs> miners and especially junior miners, in my experience, and it's a horrible, horrible experience of owning some of these names mm -hmm. over decades. Um, it's a, I can give you an analogy actually Please. after this. Please again. Um, but uh, basically, gold is Bitcoin. And those miners are shit coins. And oh, so what oh, typically oh. happens is you need the core underlying asset to rally first. Once that stops rallying, the shit coins then catch up because obviously there's a delta to it and, and you get the late late movers in and it has a high uh, alpha to it. So, so gold isn't moving. There's no way those miners are going to move right now. So wait until gold goes to three and a half thousand. And when it stops moving, you buy the miners. Yeah. And I guess there's another way, Guy. I mean, you going to the Durban mine and thinking Durban and, deep. And, and being a, <laughs> in a gold bug and this and that, whatever. I mean, you guys are aging out. I mean, I'm just saying, to, me. no, I, I'm just being serious. And so think about this. If the global market cap of gold is 14 trillion and Bitcoin just crossed one, one trillion, trillion yeah. and if you were know, to get half the market, I know. I'm, no, I know. But Bri yeah, Brian yeah, Kelly, yeah, our yeah. great friend, has yeah, been yeah. talking about this for over 10 years. Yeah, right. And so I just don't see who the incremental buyer of gold for the reasons that people are Central buying banks. Bitcoin. Central banks. Well, and, and he brings that, you bring that up a, a lot. Stop. But but as 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 Bitcoin becomes more accepted in the global financial system and this ETF mm. thing, make no mistake about it, is, is a good entree to it. And if you have enough people buying them in their Fidelity IRA or buying it on That's current right. or this or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, you know, like, could it go to $3 trillion, $4 trillion for the same reasons that I, people own gold? Sure. Absolutely. I, I think Edward Snowden, not that I follow him, but I did see his tweet, and he was coming out and saying something like, um, there will be, uh, it'll be clear that a central bank has bought Bitcoin recently. So that was also- Come on. Well, we've always already seen, what was it? Equ not Ecuador. Uh, uh, yeah, Venezuela. Uh, El Salvador. El Salvador, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. El Salvador. Okay, I that, knew that. That is not even, I'm not even yeah, on top of it. Because you, you pay attention, guy. <laughs> can do. Yes. So even El Salvador, that's a national government. Okay, it's very small. So is this another small government or is it like Singapore? Is it, you know, is it someone like Switzerland? You know, so, you know did they just buy- it's probably North North Korea, to be honest. With you. No, <laughs> I'm being the, serious. But like, they already like, buy it. But they already you, have I know, it. But if you were nor if you were one of these kind of rogue states, mm. why wouldn't you be buying that rogue risk risk asset that yeah. the whole West is kind of a little bit obsessed with, if you will? But um, like, guy, we got a couple more things to do before we get out of here. Um, we spend a lot of time on all of our pods because when we talk about the Mag Seven, which is now the Fab Four, or whatever, you know, the mega trend was obviously these chat bots introduced, you know, Chat GPT late 2022, and we've talked about this ad nauseum. Without this AI virus that infected the stock market, mm. 2023 in the stock market doesn't look like it did. Let's no. let's be very clear, right? right? And then you have things like this GLP one, this mega trend, and you know, Lily and Novo become a more than a trillion dollars in market cap. So there are some really good secular sort of stories that we know are going to play out over years, maybe decades. They got pulled forward here a little bit. Give us a sense of what you think as a buyer of technology, as a company, right? Yep. Like, you know, you're a big enterprise buyer. You guys have a big deal with Google Cloud. You rely mm -hmm. on them for a whole heck of a lot of stuff. I want to do one thing for our listener here. I want to differentiate between, okay, the excitement in and around from an enterprise standpoint, like how you're going to drive productivity and, and drive profitability for your business and, mm -hmm. and a better product and service for your customers, okay? So that's using Using these hyperscalers and, mm -hmm. and all the investment in R&D that they do. And then the flip side of it is all the things that I think got a lot of consumers excited about is like chatbots and stuff like that. They're two really different things, right? And they're going to play out really differently. Give us a sense for that because, yeah. again, you know, Amazon, 
Meta, you know, uh, obviously Microsoft and OpenAI and that partnership, Google and what they're trying to do, they're kind of falling on their face. But Trevor made a great argument to me a week in, a week ago is that Google Cloud is doing a great job in this yep. thing. It's really the commercialization, the consumer facing products is is what they're falling down on, right? Yeah, now. it sounds like crypto again, doesn't it? it sounds yep. like crypto 2.0 yeah. where you know you have a you have a, a solution um, with you looking know for, for looking for a problem, yeah, right? Yeah, and yeah. it feels a little bit like the same thing again, right? Um, yeah, I've been consistent on this. I think the first part that you mentioned, which is like chat, um, like uh, corporate efficiency, yeah. we we have it. You saw Klarna came out um, earlier this week. Um, you know, maybe they're going public or something like that, so they're, they're becoming more vocal. But the um, they 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 showed deflection in their CS, and they they saw significant deflection in their OpenAI integration. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, and there were some big moves, by the way, in a French or German. Um, BPO name, which was like basically hiring people to do customer service. Yeah. And I thought they saw like a 30% down day or something like that. So I think you're seeing the seismic shifts of like, I think fairly autonomous, um, easy-ish tasks where it just needs context and data to then tell someone else. Those jobs are going to go away pretty quickly, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's the acceleration on that side. And I think any business like ours, we, we also have BPOs and things like that. And yeah. so, you know, that'll be uh, accruing to our bottom line. Um, we've got to make sure, though, that we have great customer experience and it's not just a fire right. and forget and all the things. But um, but a lot of the time, I think these LLMs are doing a really good job of translating corporate information and customer service because it's mm -hmm. wide and it has colloquialisms and all that stuff to a consumer on demand whenever they need it. Yeah, and I guess a big differentiation here, and maybe you can kind of opine on this mm -hmm. a little bit, is like NVIDIA has gained a trillion and a half dollars in market cap over the last, over let's call it a year or so, because the demand to train these large language models, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then to kind of, you know, build the servers and the data centers and that's going to support all this stuff. But what you're talking about is the inference phase yeah, of these right. large language models that's going to cause a lot less demand once the models are already trained. So that's companies right. like yours are not rushing out to go buy H100s no. or the H200s, right? You're not double ordering them the way the hyperscalers have had to do no. because if they don't have those models on their clouds, they're going to lose business for customers yeah. like yours. Isn't that like an important yeah. distinction here? It is. And I think Trevor's been um, bang on with this, which is at the, at the, um, at the GPU level, at the, at the, at the NVIDIA hard tech level, it's cloud 2.0, right? So it's all those cloud providers. They all need those. Um, they all need compute, and they need to be able to like get the order in and have you know the latest tech. But there's not everyone. Like not everyone needs to. Like we're not going to go and build our uh, our own cloud at least not anytime soon. And so it's cloud 2.0. It's Google. It's Microsoft. Mm -hmm. It's it's Amazon, uh, Snowflake, those kind of guys, right? And so that's who. That's where the demand is. And if you look at like. What a lot of them are saying is they're trying to work around the the short supply of of what Nvidia has, and so they may be internally developing their own or finding other routes. So, Nvidia, uh, great company, uh, probably the wrong price for me. Uh, looks like Cisco in two thousand, if you ask me. You spent time in the United Kingdom, yes? I live. Yeah, I was born there. Yeah, I yeah, lived thank there. You. Yeah. I, I know this. <laughs> Where are you from in the United Kingdom? It's a place called High Wycombe, sure, west a, of London. Big, so, who's your football team? Chelsea. We of course they are. <laughs> you know, but it's interesting. I see Chelsea is probably midway through in the Premier League. I think they're like number 11 or they so. They're mid-table, unfortunately. But what's interesting is, and it all comes full circle, Dan, Nathan, that sitting atop the Premier League standings, where are the Beatles from? Uh, Liverpool. Yes, they are. <laughs> yes, they are. And as I sit here, Liverpool, having played 26 games, Dan, stands atop the standings. And I don't know if there's a club from your town. Obviously, you mentioned you're a Chelsea fan. That's pretty posh. I get it. But Man City, Arsenal, and you know, your team is sort of, <laughs> it's just sort of middle of the road there, Stu, middle of the road. It is. We uh, we lost our, our main backer, uh, Roman Abramovich. So oh, in, in wow. the, when Roman went down, that was it. We were a casualty well, of the got, Russian you Ukraine got, war. <laughs> stop it. You, got, no, you have a couple, of, you have a handful of Americans, the guys from Clear Lake. Todd um, Bowley. You have Todd Bowley. Um, this is going to be, Chelsea is going to be a powerhouse in the not so distant okay, future, a top. Go. Of the EPL, Guy Adami. We, um, we flaked at the uh, Caribou Cup against uh, against Liverpool only a week or two ago. Yeah, it's like one of these cups that we did. So we got to the final, and then we got beaten fairly hard. We lost. We lost. We lost. We lost. <laughs> But you know what? In an embarrassing way. <laughs> we are all winners for having you have join us here on hey, the On The Tape podcast. So once again, 
Stewart comes on with us every quarter. That means every how many months? He comes yeah. on actually more than that guy because he drops in. It. He's actually our landlord here, so, <laughs> yeah, well, so he's allowed to come on whenever he wants. But you know, I, just one, just to thread the needle on this oh, stuff. Right away, it's like you know, like a lot of things that you just opined on. You're doing it. We're we're just market participants, market pundits. You're actually in the trenches, you know, whether it be on the U.S. consumer front, on the sort of technology that you need to serve yeah. them, on the sort of landscape that that it takes to build companies and that sort of thing. So yeah. we're lucky to have you here, man, Thank and, and uh, we appreciate it. So you're you're welcome back whenever you want, actually. Thank you. I love being here. This is here. office. Yeah, that's right. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Stu. Thanks, Stu. Thank you.